Hey everybody, it's Josh at 226 Sources. We are a custom wheel builder here in Akron, Ohio. We also do what I refer to for our customers as a kind of custom upgrade consulting and installation. We can help people improve their bikes incrementally over time, usually starting from the wheels out, that's, since that's kind of our wheelhouse. Uh, we are back on Project Ozark. We're working with the Explorer here. In a previous video, we took this thing out of the box. We basically just threw it together as fast as possible. Didn't really do any refined assembly or worry about the brakes. Uh, shifting was most of the way there anyway. Uh, we just kind of wanted to get it together and see what this is about since this uh, bike has had so much heat online, so much interest. We wanted to say, okay, well, what is it? And it turns out it's a pretty cool bike. For 250 bucks, myself and my shop partner, Kevin, we have both been very impressed by what this thing offers. This is a uh, two by seven drivetrain. The gearing is a little bit tight. I think they could have done better here because this is a max, I think I counted this as a 26, the largest cog on the freewheel here. Uh, that means that this is not the best climber in the world out of the box. Easy fix though, we should be able to, within the upgrades that we will eventually do, probably hit that early on and uh, improve some of the gear range that this thing has to offer. In this video though, what we're really gonna concentrate on is part two. And part two is complete disassembly of everything and taking weights and really getting an idea of exactly what this bike is and uh, exactly where all the weight in the bike is. I'm kind of most curious about the wheel set, you know, because wheels is what we do, but I'm really curious about this rear wheel to get it into its component parts and find out what the weight difference is between the wheel as assembled and the wheel without the free wheel on it and, uh, and the tire as well. This is a good Kenda tire that comes from Kenda, not far from us, down in Canton, Ohio. Uh, we're actually just maybe within 20 miles of them. But getting everything apart and really getting individual weights of things so that we can put the bike back together, go for some rides, and then start thinking about what's reasonable for our upgrade path for this bike. We immediately think that wheels are probably on the menu, certainly gearing, certainly uh, brakes. These are a pretty budget, kind of a one side mechanically actuated brake caliper and for it you know it's it's pretty reasonable to upgrade those without putting a lot of money out. Um, I'm probably not going to do a full disassembly of the handlebar. We'll see as we go if I feel like it. Uh, I'm not sure if I want to unwrap this and like take the levers off and everything. This is an aluminum bar and uh, these uh, kind of brifters, these kind of integrated brake and shift levers are what they are. Uh, I don't imagine that there's a ton to find by actually taking all that apart. And from out of the box, the wrap is pretty good. <laughs> I don't know how durable it'll be, but it's it's fairly well done. Uh, so I almost don't want to mess with it. I just sort of want to put it back together the way it is so we can get some rides on it and see how it treats us. Uh, so with that, uh, let's get going on some disassembly, and blow this thing apart into its component parts. Okay, I expect us to cut this part up and fast forward through a lot of this, uh, do time lapse and maybe just capture the little segments where I'm showing details uh, during this, which is just disassembly. So let's look at a few things while we go. we can look at here on our tourney derailleur here uh, whoops even though this says 
six speed, it's on a seven speed uh, freewheel. That's really not a big deal. As long as you can set the limits so that the derailleur has enough throw to hit the outer and inner part of the freewheel, it doesn't really matter if it's designated for six speed, seven speed, eight speed, uh, they're all gonna be about the same in the Shimano family. Uh, one thing I really did wanna detail was as I pulled this off, I noticed that not a lot of grease on our fasteners. I assume that that's gonna be true of pretty much everything on the bike. Uh, as we go back together, we're gonna be dealing with re-greasing threads as things go back in. That's just for kind of protection, longevity, and good practice. If we take a moment to look at this rear caliper, uh, this is a pretty basic uh, mechanical design. Uh, basically the cable comes in here, attaches there, and then this arm makes the caliper work. I say it's a one-sided design because if we look at the way this works when I actuate it, really only one side of the caliper works. On higher end calipers, whether they're mechanical or hydraulic, both pads will come in and meet in the middle instead of just one side moving over. Uh, that's a little bit of a limitation in the design of this one. It still should be adjustable here, or maybe not. I'm not sure, time will tell. Uh, but that's kind of making the difference that I was talking about. That's the way this caliper works. It's just a pad coming over from one side, and then it squeezes the rotor. I guess it's got like anti C's on it, Neko, and then you see some measurements for this. Let's see if I can see this better. It's a 68. That means that is 68 millimeter wide shell, uh, and then 122.5 will be. Whoops. So 68 is our shell width, and then 122.5 will be the width of the spindle here, end to end. Feels fine, it's good. Nothing wrong with a square taper bottom bracket in my opinion. The front caliper is the same as the rear, but it's got this additional bracket on it. That's just to locate it for different disc sizes in the front. We can see that the front has this kind of side mount bracket. It's kind of mountain style. This makes the caliper work with that. And uh, if we went to a different disc size, uh, there's different mounting brackets that will uh, accommodate for that and kind of relocate the caliper appropriately.
Here we can just take a look at how all the cables are basically internally routed through here, but it's just a channel that's cut in, it's allowed for in the frame. It's just an open space. Uh, so we're gonna take all these, we'll take the housings and they'll run all the way through and come out where they come out up here on both sides. One over there, two over here. It's tough to call it internally routed cabling when it's really just a full length piece of housing that goes through the whole thing. Oh, whoops. As I'm taking this apart, it's worth noting some people don't quite know how this goes together. These two bolts in the stem clamp the stem onto the steerer and that keeps it solid and keeps everything in line, keeps it from moving around. But this cap, which goes here and then gets screwed down, that's actually what controls the tension on the whole headset. So you have to tighten this first. Of course, we're taking it apart now, but you tighten that first and then clamp these down to really get it in place. Uh, but the cap is important. So if you're messing around with this, don't lose that or don't think you don't need it. The cap is how you tension the headset and clamp it together before you tighten the stem on. Got that, that, a bunch of spacers, kind of a, Finish spacer, clamp ring, top race for the headset bearings, and then the headset. Here's their bottom set of uh, bearings, and that'll go on a race that's in here. Top bearings, race is already in here. So we'll just, we'll keep all that together. That is a lot of seat post, but when you uh, expect such a range of different heights of people to be able to ride this thing, you kind of need a lot of seat post to uh, account for all that. And clamp. All right, and just like that, we got ourselves a disassembled bike, basically. Wheels down here and everything else somewhat organized and laid out over here. Our fork was our trail. Let's take some weights and see what this thing's really made of. But first, we'll do a Cheeto break. 